Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ravi Salgia here at the City of Hope. I'm the Chair of Medical Oncology, and welcome to the, um, uh, the How COVID-19 Transformed Clinical Care a Virtual Year in Review. And we're the Lung Cancer Panel. I'm joined by a distinguished panel, and I, I will introduce, have them introduce themselves. Dr. Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Dr. Estela Marie Rodriguez. I am a thoracic oncologist at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center of the University of Miami. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith? Hi, my name is Dr. Cardinal Smith. I'm a thoracic oncologist and palliative medicine physician at the ICAM School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Jill Feldman? Hi, my name is Jill Feldman. I am a lung cancer patient and advocate, and I am also the co-founder of the EGFR Resistors. Thank you, Jill. And it's our pleasure to present to you together in the next um, hour and a half or so. And first I'll be presenting non-small cell lung cancer immunotherapy and biosimilars. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about lung cancer and then go into immunotherapy and non-small cell lung cancer, and then talk about biosimilars. As you know, lung cancer is still um, very high in terms of its incidence and prevalence. Over 200,000 patients will be diagnosed this year alone with lung cancer. Unfortunately, about 160,000 patients will die of lung cancer alone this year. And it's a tough disease, uh, both for men as well as women. It is the highest mortality, as you can appreciate here. At the same time, we know lung cancer, when I started my career about 30 years ago, was only divided into non-small cell lung cancer as compared to small cell lung cancer. Now we have divided it and subdivided it incredibly, and you'll hear that from the whole panel today. And as you know, small cell lung cancer is a very aggressive disease. It rapidly metastasizes. And we don't have as many therapies for small cell lung cancer as compared to non-small cell. And we'll hear Dr. Rodriguez's um, evaluation on small cell lung cancer. And for non-small cell lung cancer, it's subdivided now into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. But in the US alone, adenocarcinoma is the largest um, uh, occurrence as one can imagine, and you can have molecular alterations. Even with all of the staging that we do for non-small cell lung cancer, it's based on the tumor nodal metastasis classification. Uh, we don't have as good a survival as compared to, for example, breast cancer or colon cancer, and even like Hodgkin's disease. So we need to make a huge difference. And we'll talk about that today. And we know there's a lot of heterogeneity in lung cancer. As you can imagine, in my mind, lung cancer is no longer lung cancer. It's a cancer that arises within the lung that has a certain characteristic, such as an EGFR mutation or an ALK translocation or an RS1 translocation or Medexon 14 uh, splicing variation. And we have to take all of that into account along with how a patient is doing and the performance status of the patient so precision medicine and personalized medicine is very important in terms of our therapeutics. I'd like to talk to you about immunotherapy. When we first started looking at immunotherapy a long time ago, we really didn't have a clear idea of if it was gonna work or not. And clearly the code has been broken for non-small cell lung cancer. And as you can appreciate here, a number of therapeutics have come to fruition for non-small cell lung cancer. And we'll talk about them in a few minutes. So the take home message for immunotherapy, for non-small cell lung cancer and for other cancers is that T cells are incredibly important for us to have that recognition of the tumor cells so that it can uh, end up killing those tumor cells. And of course, we wanna make sure that side effects are very minimal. So we know that there are therapeutics against anti-PD-1 as well as anti-PDL1. So those are called immune checkpoint inhibitors that have come to fruition in our clinical practice. And we also know that it's not very simple as just anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1. There are so many factors that go on within the human body to attack the um, abnormal cells or the malignant cells. And you can appreciate that here. I won't go into that in detail, 
But what you have to really realize is there's, there's a cancer antigen release and presentation, then there's T cells priming and activation, and thereafter trafficking and infiltration of the T cells, and the recognition and killing of the cancer cells by the T cells. And really, it is very important to realize that it takes a concerted effort within the human body, along with the immune checkpoint inhibition, to come back with a therapeutic kill for the cancer cells themselves. So how do we think about non-small cell lung cancer? We think about early stage disease, we think about late stage disease. And initially, when I began my career, we only had a few choices for our patients with advanced disease non-small cell lung cancer. Now we have many choices, but we do have to factor into account what are the biomarkers that are important so that we can therapeutically uh, achieve a good balance with our patients and have the minimal toxicities. I'll talk a lot about what's in the box and that is the immune therapy. So we know pembrolizumab has been approved, nivolumab with ipilimumab has been approved, atizolizumab has been approved, dorolumab has been approved. And all of that is in our decision-making as we go forward for non-small cell lung cancer. So here are the FDA approved immune checkpoint inhibitors in non-small cell lung cancer. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but you can actually appreciate on the left-hand side panel that nivolumab or nivolumab with epilumumab or pembrolizumab, dervolumab, atizolizumab have been approved. And all of these slides are definitely available to you for further details. And they are actually in our guidelines and they are in our pathways as well. We tend to use the NCCN guidelines and we also use pathways in our clinical practice. And here are some of these clinical trials that led to the approval for pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab does require a molecular biomarker, and that is the 22C3. And that is for making sure that indeed the pembrolizumab can potentially work. And you can see that these are all these keynote trials, and pembrolizumab has been approved as a single agent in a second line therapy, as well as a first line agent if. Uh, and only if uh, the um, 22C3 biomarker is greater than or equal to 50%, and that's the uh, PDL1 biomarker. It's also approved in combination with chemotherapy, for example, in adenocarcinoma with carboplatinum, pemetrexid with pembrolizumab, of course, in squamous histologies with carboplatinum, with taxane, along with pembrolizumab, is one of the first line therapies that we utilize in our clinical practice. We also know nivolumab has been approved as well as a second line agent, but it's also approved now as a first line agent in combination with epilumumab. And atizolizumab has also been approved as you can appreciate here. And there are many studies that are ongoing that have really revolutionized our clinical practice, but it's also made it a very complex in terms of our decision-making. So we do need to be able to adhere to our guidelines as well as to our pathways that are important in our clinical practice here in the United States, as well as worldwide. And then of course, uh, for earlier stage disease like stage three disease, dervolumab uh, has been approved after chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and abelumab is coming to fruition as well, as you can appreciate here. So uh, one of the things that we have to take into account are the adverse events or the toxicities from the immunotherapies. Immunotherapies are very well tolerated majority of times. Many of you have also done that in your clinical practice. Some of you are patients here on this audience and you see those TV commercials or have already undergone these types of therapies. And like I said, majority of times it's tolerated, but you can have adverse events. And the adverse events are any inflammatory events that can occur throughout the body. And uh, at the same time, what I reflect here are the organs. So you can have hypophysitis, you can have dermatitis, you can have thyroiditis or pneumonitis or nephritis or hepatitis or colitis. And those are all important as we think about them as your clinic care pro providers to be able to make sure that we can manage them. And majority of times it's very manageable, but sometimes you also have to get the experts involved, such as the endocrinologist or the pulmonologist to be able to treat the side effects properly. And it is important to also note that one can have these adverse side effects 
But as we looked at it in our own database, as you can see on the right-hand side with the progression-free survival, and you can see on the ordinate is the PFS or progression-free survival, and on the abscissa are the weeks, that you can have a differential if you have adverse events as compared to non-adverse events. These are preliminary data, but it is important to realize that this is what we're thinking about, that those patients who develop side effects, do they do better? Do they do worse? How do we manage through all of these side effects at the same time? What we also look forward to in 2021, and as we go forward for the next five years, you know, immune checkpoint here uh, inhibitors are here to stay. But we have seen our, some of our patients with hyperprogression. We have seen some of our patients not respond. We have seen some of our patients who progress through these. So can you have combinational events of immune checkpoint inhibitors with various other targets? And here are all the targets, or actually, I should say, here are some of the targets that are important one can appreciate. And that's coming to fruition, such as LAG3 or VISTA or TEM3. Uh, as an example here. Again, a very busy slide here. These are available to you to go into further details themselves. And there are resistant mechanisms to immunotherapy. I talked a little bit about hyperprogression. So uh, if you have, for example, an STK11 inactivation, some of the times we see hyperprogression as related to that. It's been published, for example, the JAK-STAT pathway can lead to uh, abnormalities in terms of progression. And here are some of the pathways that have been described over this year and over the past several years that we're taking into account in our molecular analysis and precision medicine as we think about our patients and their patient care themselves. And here are some of the clinical trials that are ongoing. And it's very confusing, of course, uh, for everyone to realize because so many trials for so many diseases, not only lung cancer, but for other diseases, but it is important to have champions who understand these clinical trials and to be able to be put on these clinical trials if possible as well. And then here are some of the trials going on at our uh, center as well, as you can appreciate a large number of trials with a large number of investigators themselves. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and that's the immune checkpoint inhibitors, but before I get into this, I just wondered if the panel has a thought on to the immune therapies themselves. And I could start off with Dr. Rodriguez as to how you think about immunotherapies. And um, so I think, you know, we have more choices and more drugs. And I think um, we have some historical experience now of patients that have done very well with, you know, the initial single agent immunotherapies. Now we have more data for combination immunotherapy. So we're all trying to sort out which patient will respond best to what of those options, but definitely has changed the landscape. We are seeing more long-term survivors uh, who are doing well. And the difficult questions right now are in our clinic are, are we comfortable stopping drugs on patients who are on remission or doing have no progression after two years? And I think we need more data to guide us um, going forward. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Dr. Smith, your thoughts? I mean, I absolutely agree. I think um, if one thing COVID had shown, shown me, if not us, um, is that those patients who were in this category of doing well in immunotherapy and really stopping because of the pandemic and their concern about going to medical centers for treatment. Um, you know, I've had several patients who continued to have a good response now, eight months later, um, and some who have not done as well. Um, so there's still a lot of unanswered questions for us. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Jill, your thoughts? I, I think that immunotherapy has completely changed the landscape of lung cancer for a certain population of patients. Uh, we definitely would like there to be a way to better stratify uh, which treatment the patient would get because there are so many but that's a great problem to have. And I agree with you, Dr. Smith, a lot of patients are more comfortable now waiting for treatment. In the beginning, you know, patients were anxious about not getting their treatment at, on the schedule they were used to. So that definitely has eased anxiety for a lot of people in the community. Thank you, Jill. 
So the second topic that I um, am going to talk to you a little bit about is biosimilars. And we know the cost of cancer care is in billions of dollars for uh, us here in the United States. And we know that um, global oncology costs have gone up uh, with skyrocketing effects, as you can see here, that it's $150 billion in 2020. We also know that this is a financial burden on our patients, their families, and the healthcare system uh, in the whole United States. And we know that drug costs are a burden on cancer patients. There's a financial toxicity. There are harmful effects of cancer costs on patients' well being. And there are discussions about costs and value that are important. And, you know, ASCO has value based system in terms of the therapeutics, the efficacy, as well as the toxicity, but they also involve the financial toxicities. And we have to be very cognizant as we go forward in terms of our therapeutics and cancer. So one of the things that has revolutionized our practice, and we use this in our practice here at the City of Hope, are biosimilars. And so what are biosimilars? You'll hear more about biosimilars as you go through it. Many of uh, our patients ask us about what are biosimilars and are they gonna be just as efficacious and uh, not as toxic uh, or just as toxicity profile the same? And the answer is yes. And so these are biological products and biosimilars are thoroughly tested for safety, purity, and potency. And they're highly similar to the reference product. And the FDA approval is required before it's used. That's important to know. The difference between biologics and biosimilars I reflect here, and as you can appreciate on the biologics I highlighted, is that it's patentable and there's a reference price, but the biosimilars are non-patentable and there's a reduced price. And that's so important for all of our patients and providing care to everyone who has cancer. And so there are biosimilars who have, which have been FDA approved and I list them here. And some of them we've started to use in our common practice. And it's really revolutionary for us. And we've been able to have cost containment as well with the same therapeutic efficacy. And we're quite excited. And I highlight some of them, for example, bevacizumab or rituximab and trastuzumab and the others that are listed here as well. And then their uh, characteristics are similar. So that's why FDA approves these biosimilars. Otherwise, we would not use them in our clinical practice themselves. And this, uh, for one example, for example, as you know, uh, bevacizumab is an anti-angiogenic. It's important in terms of taking away that tumor genesis that has the high HIP-1 alpha. And as some of you know, last year, uh, there was a Nobel Prize related to all of these hypoxia, and that was so important. And bevacizumab is an important therapeutic target. And as we use that in our clinical practice here, uh, we wanted to make sure that when we started to use the biosimilars, that it was very efficacious and toxicity profile was the same. And indeed, here are the structural similarities in the biosimilar called ABP215 and bevacizumab. And um, I'm not here to talk about mass spectroscopy, but these are all the rigors that people have to go through in order to qualify to be a biosimilar. And then the preclinical data has to be done in the mouse model. Those are called xenografts as well as pharmacokinetic studies and very similar between the two agents themselves. And then you have to prove the clinical efficacy. That is that they are similar and indeed that you can see uh, in the patient population on the right with the progression-free survival, very similar. And so they're equivalent and that's why this came to fruition. Uh, and you can also look at the targeted lesions with the ABP215 as compared to the bevacizumab. And this is very um, uh, eye-opening for us because biosimilars did not used to be used as a common practice, but now we use that as our common practice here. And of course, this reflects the toxicities in between ABP215 and bevacizumab. And again, I wanted to summarize that a little bit for the biosimilars. And for lung cancer, it is the leading cause of cancer death uh, in the US as long as world, as, as well as the worldwide. Immunotherapies have come to fruition and they're here to stay. And we're excited because we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing survival for stage four patients with immunotherapies, which is just amazing. And then biosimilars are also here to stay as well. And 
we use that commonly in our practice. And I wanted to start off a little bit differently. So Jill, what do you think about the biosimilars? I, I think the biosimilars are great. I had to learn about them. And so when it's talked about within the lung cancer community for patients, I think there just has to be a little more education uh, given when patients are discussing it with their care team, because quite often you will have a patient say, it, but I was taking this medication and then I took the generic and it didn't work as well. So I think obviously financial toxicity, that is the, the most common toxicity and a grade five for patients. So they are fabulous, but I just uh, would love to see patients more educated when they're discussing it with their care team. Thank you, Jill. Dr. Smith, your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, similarly, I am a fan of biosimilars. I, it's interesting here in Jill's uh, patient perspective because I, I wonder um, how much conversation actually happens between the clinician and the patient about biosimilars. If anything, I think it's more happening on the back end that a clinician orders a drug and um, our clinical pathways are approving sort of uh, based off of a biosimilar, if there is a biosimilar drug that exists, that's what's being approved first because it is cheaper. And I often wonder how many patients know that they're getting a biosimilar. Great, thank you. And that's really an important question. And we all in our practice have to make sure that we're discussing that with our patients. Dr. Rodriguez, your thoughts? Um, so I agree with Jill and uh, Dr. Smith that we do have more of these discussions uh, with the payer who is basically telling us that the biosimilar is the drug that they're approving instead of having these uh, conversations with the patient. But when I have had these conversations, it is um, important to know that you know, this, these drugs are approved by the FDA. They have taken time to be developed. So they're not, they're safe and they can provide the same level of efficacy. So I think the more we use them, the more we get used to them, I will imagine that they will go up in use. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great and great discussion, all three of you. And so we'll move on to the next talk. And this, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rodriguez. So um, Dr. Rodriguez, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So we mean, this is a, a panel talking about how COVID-19 has transformed clinical care. And we, when you hear that title, you think that you know, horrible things have happened during this period of COVID, but very exciting things have happened in the lung cancer community during COVID. We have had nine drugs approved since March of 2020 and we're still counting, we haven't finished the year. So it really has been an unprecedented year in terms of development and offering better options for patients. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to cover today some of the new exciting targeted therapies and why today for a lung cancer patient, like we discussed earlier, it's important to know not only that it's a non-small cell lung cancer, but what type of adenocarcinoma, uh, what kind of molecular driver, is present in the tumor so that we can pick a better treatment since we have better targeted therapies. And we'll talk about RET and med exon 14 skip mutation uh, options for patients. We also have exciting new treatments for small cell lung cancer, which had been a cancer that we have known for a long time that is aggressive and we hadn't had changes in that treatment for over 20 years. And now we have immunotherapy and new second line options for patients. And then I'll talk about some treatments that I expect will be approved shortly um, that we're very exciting and following um, having to do with HER2, KRAS, and Ocimartinib in the adjuvant setting. Next slide. So these are my conflicts of interest. Next slide. So this is just to show you um, the history of lung cancer treatment advances. And you can tell that a lot has happened in the last 10 years and in the last year. And I just uh, note here the nine drugs that have been approved since March. I and mean, we really had not seen that many approvals, at least I had never seen that many approvals for long in one month in May, 2020, a lot has happened. And this has been exciting that the FDA is uh, moving these dr drugs forward, uh, especially the targeted therapies on require large trials and we're able to offer these options for patients. Next slide. So let's talk about RED and MEC exon 14, uh, which are rare mutations, but lung cancer being such a common cancer, there's a significant amount of patients worldwide that would benefit from these treatments. Next slide. 
the, the, I'll start with the one that was approved last, uh, which is Prosetinib or Blue 667, and it's a treatment approved for red fusion. So these are not mutations, these are fusions. Um, this was um, shown in the phase one, phase two arrow clinical trial that was a registration data set for this red inhibitor. Uh, these red fusions are observed in one to 2% of patients. And, but if you don't look for these uh, fine mutations, um, huge fusions, you don't find them. So we have gone back in our databases and found patients that had red fusions that had been treated with chemotherapy and immunotherapy and now are eligible for these options. Uh, Prostetinib is a selective red inhibitor, so it works, it's more potent than prior uh, multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we had used uh, for patients with red. Um, and then the phase one trial initially reported a, a very uh, impressive response rate of 58% in a group of 48 patients, and 60% of those patients had prior uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. Next slide. So this is the waterfall plot, just to show you that uh, regardless of the prior treatment, uh, most patients on these trials had a response and the tumor reduction rate was impressive. It was about 96%, uh, even more impressive on patients that had not had treatment. So this is a great option in the first line setting. This drug was approved just recently in September, 2020. There were patients, a lot of the patients on this trial had prior immunotherapy. Uh, there were 6% complete responses and in treatment naive patients, there were 12% complete responses. So this is very exciting. Um, we know that red fusion, um, red fusion ab aberrations are found um, in um, patients um, regardless of their smoking status. Uh, we also know that some of these patients have a high rate of brain metastasis. So um, this drug particularly was developed with that in mind and has a very um, has a strong activity in the for brain metastasis with 56% 56, 56 uh, overall response rate and a complete response rate in the brain of 33%, which is very impressive. Next slide. So this is just to show you again that the response rates are seen in patients that had prior platinum and patients that were treatment naive um, in the range of 55 to 66%. But what's really impressive is that the duration of response uh, reaches almost 90 and 80%. So that patients that start these treatments are able to continue on these targeted treat, uh, therapies for a long time. And we're excited that we're able to offer this to patients. Next slide. In terms of toxicity, I, we have um, had patients on the original trial at our institution and we initially learned to manage hypertension better. Uh, we, um, we have seen a grade three hypertension about 10%. Um, also some myelosuppression with patients that have, um, have had neutropenia. So you have to counsel them for neutropenic fever precautions and also patients with anemia. In terms of GI side effects, uh, it's very manageable um, and fatigue is being uh, seen not as profound. Um, so we tend to follow patients' liver function tests and blood pressures closely. However, the discontinuation rate due to treatment-related adverse events was low 4%. Um, so patients were able to uh, maintain a full dose of drug about 92% of the time. Next slide. There's another drug that was approved prior to this one in May 2020, and that's silpercatinib. So they're both uh, uh, drugs that target red fusions. Um, the dosing for this drug instead of the other one is 160 milligrams twice daily with very impressive objective responses of 64% on patients that were previously treated with a platinum-based chemotherapy. And in the first line setting, 85% response rates. It was also very safe. There, it was only a 2% discontinuation rate of this drug. And again, the median duration of response uh, was 17.5 months, so patients are able to stay on drug uh, for a long time. The same side effects profiled in terms of hypertension and liver function abnormalities. Next slide. So uh, selpercatinib was tested in the Libretto 1 trial. And again, the waterfall plot here demonstrates that regardless of the prior treatment, patients that had prior immunotherapy or no prior immunotherapy um, had responses that were long lasting and a tumor shrinkage. Next slide. So we we'll switch gears here and talk about cabmatinib. So this is for a completely different uh, uh, mutation. In this case, met exon 14 skipping mutation. And on the left, I show you that the normal splicing um, uh, would allow for this uh, tyrosine um, kinase re re receptors to lead to pathway activation and degradation. When you have an aberrant splicing mechanism, this um, 
receptors are, the degradation of these receptors is um, disrupted and the, it serves as a proto-oncogene that the cells are activated. So these are also rare mutations. Um, they're found in two to 4% of cases. However, uh, if you look for them, you'll find them. So this is important that you do a full next generation sequencing on your patients so that you can identify these new uh, patients that are candidates for treatment options. Um, like in the prior, we saw very impressive response rates um, in this trial. Um, there were two cohorts that were initially tested and that had responses of around 40% and the duration of response was uh, significant. In the waterfall plot, you see also that there were some amount of complete responses and some partial responses. Next slide. So again, this is for Mexin, Cadmatinib. It's approved now for met exon 14 skip mutation, which is not met amplification, it's something completely uh, different. Um, the dosing of this drug is 400 milligrams twice a day. It has shown efficacy in the second line setting for patients that were previously treated with response rates of 41% and in patients that had no prior treatment, about 68% response rates. The disease control rate is also impressive at 78% for patients that had prior failed prior treatments and 96% for patients that were treatment naive. The grade three um, adverse uh, events related to the treatment were about 35%. So there was a lot of peripheral edema and fatigue that we need to manage. And this drug was approved in May, 2020. Next slide. So now I'll switch gears and talk about small cell lung cancer. And small cell lung cancer is it's about 15% of the cancers that we see, um, but it's a found, we know that these are more aggressive tumors um, that uh, we find them early. We're able to offer patients uh, radiation, but most patients are found with extensive disease. And for the longest time, the only options we had were cisplatin and toposide. Uh, for these patients with radiation and, and prophylactic cranial radiation. But now, uh, next slide. Um, we learned um, last year in the EMPOWER trials that immunotherapy with atezolizumab uh, can be added to a platinum-based regimen to improve outcomes on these patients. And in, in March of 2020, we have an approval now for another uh, PDL1 inhibitor, Dorvalumab that can be added to carboplatin etoposide or cisplatin etoposide for patients with extensive disease. This was based on the phase three international Caspian study. Next slide. And this is a complicated trial because they had one arm that had, uh, the control arm had um, chemotherapy alone. And then there was one arm that had combination immunotherapy with chemotherapy and another arm, which is Durvalumab and immunotherapy. Uh, the arm that was post that showed our response was Durvalumab and um, um, platinum-based chemotherapy. And that's the one we will discuss. Next slide. So you see that um, at one year, um, there was um, overall survival advantage to having received immunotherapy. Um, with the chemotherapy and in the maintenance setting. Um, and then at every point in that curve, one point we like to make is that you are better off if you have started with immunotherapy and you have small cell lung cancer. The hazard ratio was 0.75. Um, and we see this difference in the curves up to past two years uh, for patients that are still responding to treatment. So it is definitely, um, when you look at the absolute numbers of in improvement in median survival, it's not as impressive. The median survival was 12.29 months versus 10.5 months. But the message that I discussed with patients is that, that at any point in that curve, wherever you're gonna fall, you're gonna be better off with the immunotherapy added to the chemotherapy. So we, we are excited that we can offer this to patients. Next slide. Um, the overall response rate, again, is higher if you have immunotherapy with the chemotherapy and the median duration of response was seen to be similar because initially um, both arms had responded, but long-term you maintain the response um, longer if you are in the immunotherapy arm. Next slide. So I'll switch gears to second line. So for the longest time, we really, for patients with small cell lung cancer who have failed platinum-based chemotherapy, especially if they're platinum refractory and they progress fast, we don't really have a lot of options uh, for patients. Um, you know, many of these patients are very debilitated and we really have discussions about goals of care at that stage since our next option is topotecan that can be very myelosuppressive and not all patients can tolerate. Now we have another option that was approved in the FDA um, seeing small cell lung cancer as an area of need. 
approved this in June 2020. Uh, Lorinectidem is um, an alkaloid analog. It selectively inhibits transactivated transcription and modulates the microenvironment. This was tasted in a single agent phase two trial, and it showed an overall response rate of 35% in the second line setting. Some of the adverse events to monitor are myelosuppression, fatigue, and LFT abnormalities. The response rates, again, are about 30%, and the duration of response, obviously not as impressive as targeted treatments, but for small cell lung cancer, this is significant that we can offer patients something that will allow them to respond in the second line setting. Um, so next slide. So we'll talk now about new treatments in the horizon, and this has been a, an unprecedented year that we have had approvals almost every month for lung cancer. And we're monitoring two, three specific drugs that I think we will be seeing more data coming shortly. Next slide. Um, the first one that got a lot of press um, in the last months has been osimertinib, which is not a new drug. We have used it as a first line option for patients with EGFR positive lung cancer. But now we have, um, for the first time, data that osimertinib can play a role in the adjuvant setting for patients that had EGFR mutation and had had surgery, either with chemotherapy after surgery uh, or radiation. If you can add osimertinib for patients that have these mutations, you can make a difference. And um, I think uh, this has really changed our, is going to change how we treat patients. You know, many centers don't test routinely for EGFR mutations for patients that have resected lung cancer. So that's one of the first things that would have to change based on this data. Next slide. Um, so just to um, give you some background. So surgery is the primary treatment for patients that have early stage lung cancer. Unfortunately, we don't meet as many patients as with early stage lung cancer as we meet patients with advanced lung cancer. The, the standard treatment after surgery has been adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy um, based on um, trials that are now older uh, that basically show that chemotherapy can improve survival more in the stage two and threes, but there's a selected group of patients with stage B that can also benefit with half the ratios of 0.4 and some toxicity. Um, so if we look at the disease recurrence or death following surgery, we see that this is an area of need that even we can offer surgery to patients that are lucky enough to be diagnosed early, either through screening or symptoms, or sometimes by chance, the five-year recurrence uh, by stage is significant for a stage 1B there's about a 45% 45 five-year recurrence. And as you go up in the stage to stage two and three, that recurrence could go up first of 70%. Next slide. So the Adara phase three double blind study, um, and there's a lot of um, discussion about you know, how the study was conducted internationally, what the arm, the placebo arm um, treatments that were available for patients and the brain imaging that was uh, conducted in different centers. But in general, uh, patients were stratified by stage 1B one, one versus 2 versus 3. And also we included patients with EGFR mutation, exon deletion 19, and LA58R. Um, we also, uh, the study was also stratified by race, Asian versus non-Asian. Um, and patients receive osimertinib for up to three years. And then the, um, um, the study was uh, prematurely stopped and unblinded uh, because of a very big difference, which we'll discuss in the disease recurrence. Next slide. So these are the, the graphs that you can argue with as, as much as people have comments about you know, how the study was conducted and how patients were followed. These are very impressive disease-free curve, uh, survival curves for patients that had surgery. Um, and were followed. So you see that if you were in the osimertinib arm, which is the blue line on top at every point, and very early on, you have a benefit, like you are less likely to progress um, uh, systemically, especially in the brain, outside the brain, and even locally. Next slide. And um, what people, what we're awaiting, but the study now is being unblinded, so we don't know how this data is gonna read out it, uh, going forward, is the overall survival. Are we delaying uh, progression of disease and ultimately the survival is not gonna be that different, but we feel with such a big difference in disease-free survival, we will see differences in overall survival and we'll, you know, we'll have to stay uh, tuned for that. But this is the early snapshot of the survival curves and there is, uh, it does favor the osimertinib arm. Next slide. So in conclusions for this, the FDA has already given this a breakthrough designation in July, 2020. And I think there'll be more data reviewed going forward. 
but this is the first targeted Asian in a global trial to show a statistically significant and minimal, meaningful improvement in disease-free survival for patients that had had surgery for non-small cell lung cancer. This is only for patients that had EGFR mutations and those two specific mutations and patients will have to be on treatment for three years after surgery. And there's a consistent improvement in disease-free survival regardless of whether patients receive prior adjuvant chemotherapy. And the safety profile was consistent with that of osimertinib, what we have seen in the advanced setting. Next slide. Uh, the next uh, type of drug that we are monitoring is the HER2. Um, we know that there are HER2 alterations in non-small cell lung cancer. And for a long time, we have tried different drugs either using breast cancer or multitarsin kinase inhibitors, but we have not been able to get response rates that were consistent. Um, the FDA has recently reviewed uh, trastuzumab, the Ruxtecan, which is an antibody com uh, compound with chemotherapy that can give us a stronger response rate for these patients with a progression-free survival of 14 months. Next slide. Um, so this is a humanized anti-HER2 antibody. Um, that has a topo isomerase one inhibitor payload. So basically de delivers a chemotherapy to the tumor and uh, has been clinically evaluated in different tumor types and in lung cancer has been shown to have efficacy. Next slide. So the Destiny Long One uh, study design um, had enrolled unresectable on on metastatic non squamous non small cell lung cancer patients that have failed prior treatment and had either a HER2 activating mutation or a HER2 expressing tumor. Um, these patients um, had two cohorts, ones that were you know, HER2 expressing and HER2 mutate, mutation, and the data cutoff was in November. The FDA already gave this a breakthrough designation in May 2020. Um, about 45% uh, of the patients in cohort two remain on treatment, so patients were having long-lasting responses. Next slide. So this is the waterfall plot. Uh, we see that there's a confirmed overall response rate by um, independent review of about 62%. Um, there are about 2% complete response rates, which is exciting for patients that have failed prior treatment that have these HER2 mutations or alterations. And the progression-free survival in this small trial, but again, this is targeted treatments. We don't need large trials to show efficacy. The progression-free survival was 14 months. Next slide. Um, so here, um, this, discussing the treatment-related um, adverse events that we're seeing in more than 15% of patients. So there is significant toxicity. This is delivering chemotherapy. We see um, cytopenia, diarrhea, vomiting. Most of the grade threes are, can be managed, um, but we are more talking about the traditional chemotherapy when we use this drug. Um, so we will counsel patients, give uh, anti-emetics, and monitor patients closely. Next slide. The last drug I wanna cover is an, an area of need. About 13% of patients with lung cancer have KRAS, specifically KRAS G12C mutation. And we have been following closely um, drugs that are being developed. This is one of the drugs that has already presented data based on the code break uh, trial. It was a multi-center open label phase one trial where patients that had metastatic lung cancer and the KRAS G12 mutation had had prior treatments were enrolled about 59% uh, patients were enrolled and there was a dose escalation that got to the dose of 960 milligrams a day. Next slide. So some of the exciting data are that we can get responses targeting KRAS, which KRAS we know for a long time is a marker of poor, of poor responses to treatment, poor responses to immunotherapy, poor responses to chemotherapy, and more aggressive disease. So Having a drug that will target this pathway uh, is something that is an area of need and we're excited that we are getting closer. The confirmed objective response rate from this drug uh, was about 30, 30%, 35%, and the, the disease control rate in many, many of these patients were between 80 and 90%. So we are awaiting more data uh, on this drug and other drugs on this pathway. Um, next slide. So in conclusions, targeted therapies are the standard treatment for patients with driver alterations. And it's important that when you meet with your doctor, if you have a new diagnosis, that you request that this uh, information is obtained prior to treatment. We know that specifically in osimertinib, there is data that if you start immunotherapy early and then move to osimertinib, you may increase toxicity to the lung. And we're seeing some case reports also of that being found in sulpercatinib, which is one of the red inhibitors 
So again, it's important to know the drive alteration so that we can pick the best treatment. Uh, we already have options that we have had for some time for EGFR, ALK, and ROS, and TRAC, now BRAF, and now we can are excited that we can offer pati of, of patients to options, uh, options to patients with HER2, RED, and med exon 14 skip mutations. In extensive small cell lung cancer, chemoimmunotherapy is now the standard, and we have two options that are FDA approved, uh, platinum etoposide with Urbalumab or atezolizumab are the current standards. Uh, so that's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, mm -hmm. a brilliant presentation, thank you. And that's a lot of information and you did it so nicely. And I, I wanted to say, you know, um, precision medicine is here, personalized medicine is here. And I do think that everybody should be sequenced to make sure. Uh, I think small cell is not there yet as compared to non-small cell, but this is phenomenal in terms of therapeutics. Um, what do you think, Dr. Smith? I mean, I completely agree with you. Similarly to um, the comment that you actually made earlier, um, I think about when I finished fellowship, which was just in 2010, and it was during my fellowship that Pemetrexid was approved. Um, and we felt how, you know, how landscape changing that was at the time. And so to see where we are now, um, you know, lung cancer is now complicated and it is multiple diseases in one. Um, and so we've definitely come a long way. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Jill, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree as well. And I wanna add on to what Dr. Smith said. I have an extensive family history of lung cancer, losing gr two grandparents and my dad when I was 13 and my mom and my aunt when I was in my 20s. And at the time in 2000, there were three treatment options. And my mom died, uh, my mom had small cells. She was the only one and was dead within months of diagnosis. So I think that any advancements in small cell lung cancer are great, but we can't become complacent and we have to continue to work hard and find more treatments uh, for that population. I think the rapid change in the field of precision medicine has been phenomenal. I think the frustra frustration within our community sometimes is that the discoveries are happening a lot faster then the treatments are being approved. And so that, you know, when you, now that we could see all the research that's going on and patients don't qualify for a trial necessarily because they sometimes get that one dose after diagnosis, whatever the case is, it's, it's really moving fast. And I think there needs to be an emphasis on the biomarker testing of newly diagnosed patients, guidelines, and more education out there for physicians in the community setting because they cannot possibly keep up with lung cancer and then all the other cancers they treat. Great. Thank you for the thoughtful comments. Um, so we'll go on to the next presentation and uh, you'll lead us, Dr. Smith, and yes. uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so it's my charge today to talk to you about um, remote virtual management along with side effect management for lung cancer. Um, you can go to the next slide. So a quick outline of what we're talking about, which is really telehealth um, in general and focusing on the ways in which telehealth changed our treatment paradigm and cancer care delivery in the COVID-19 pandemic era. Um, and also talk about management of lung cancer and side effects. So next slide, yeah. So, you know, telehealth is really a tool to be able to enhance healthcare, uh, public health and health education delivery and support using electronic communication and information as the main modality. Um, and it's really to be able to provide care to patients um, and services at a distance and for patients to be able to receive that care. Next slide. Um, so there are several types of telehealth. There are three big domains. These include synchronous, asynchronous, and then remote patient monitoring. Synchronous is probably what most of us um, are familiar with. Um, and this is really real-time telephone or audio video interaction, typically with a patient using a smartphone, tablet, or computer. 
Um, in some cases, there may be peripheral medical equipment that's used like digital stethoscopes, otoscopes, ophthalmoscopes. Um, and it can be used by other healthcare clinicians, including advanced practice providers, nurses, um, and um, it's typically done remotely. Um, asynchronous really refers to patient portals um, that facilitate this type of communication between the provider and patient through secure messaging. Um, this is sort of considered a store and forward technology where either messages, images, or data are collected um, and then interpreted at a later time. I think this kind of information is becoming even more important um, because next week, as part of the Cures Act, um, patients are required to have automatic access to all of their available electronic medical record data, both outpatient and inpatient. Um, and then lastly, remote patient monitoring is something that I think is pretty, um, in the, in pretty much in its infancy in cancer care, um, but this allows direct transmission of patients' clinical measurements from a distance. So these are devices that patients wear that track their vitals, um, weight, um, and other things and communicate that back in real time to the clinicians for monitoring um, and treatment. Next slide. So, you know, I am based in New York City where we really had the brunt of the pandemic surge uh, in the spring. And so this shows um, the bars are the total number of cases that we experienced in New York City um, by the date, which is on the, the X axis. The purple, the dark purple line refers to the total number of hospitalizations, um, and then the lighter purple line uh, is the total number of deaths. And so um, during the COVID-19 pandemic surge, we were, um, you know, we were hit with uh, many patients coming in to seek COVID care. And unlike many other specialties in medicine that were, that sort of closed down, flipped completely to remote monitoring to telehealth. Um, in cancer, we had to be able to really provide a hybrid model because there were still many patients who needed to seek in-person care. Next slide. Um, and so during COVID-19, telehealth really played several roles. First was that it limited exposures, not only to those patients, to, ge to general population at large, um, certainly to those patients who were at higher risk, um, including patients with cancer, as well as staff, healthcare staff, and, and, and other clinicians. Um, it helped to preserve PPE. So if we limited the number of patients coming into the center, it was less masks, gowns that needed to be worn, um, really helped to reduce the surge so that it, by decreasing exposures, decreased the potential risk for people being infected and really allowed us to continue cancer care. And it may not have been in the way and the model in which we were used to, but it did give us the ability to connect with patients to still be able to monitor them and assess them um, and to provide care delivery. Next slide. So there were several drivers of change that happened simultaneously in terms of making telehealth work the way they did. Um, you know, first, to really stand this up quickly, the Center for Medicare Services, or CMS, really relaxed where, how, and with whom patients can access virtual care. So the major shift that happened were that really patients could access telehealth not only from their home, but they could also um, use it within healthcare facilities, and not just the hospital, an office, or a skilled nursing facility. Um, and previously, really only follow-up visits were allowed to use telehealth, but now this included new patients and new access. Um, and when we think about this in a cancer care delivery model, you know, this could really allow patients who live in more rural environments, for example, a way to access care at a, you know, a, 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 a national cancer designated institute um, send, send it, setting um, so that they could get another consult and still receive their care locally, um, but it sort of broadens the opportunities and abilities for patients to receive care. Um, additionally, it broadened the type of devices that we were able to use um, and platforms. So instead of using patient portals only, um, FaceTime, Skype, um, and other things were able to be used um, because sort of those HIPAA restrictions and the level of security were able to be relaxed. Um, similarly, 
um, audio visits were allowed for increased reimbursement, um, similar to a level of video visit. So for those patients who don't have access to um, patient portals, broadband, um, maybe there's some digital health literacy issues, um, they were able to have telephone encounters with their, with their uh, clinicians, cancer clinicians. Um, and then, you know, I think another really interesting thing is that Medicare allowed other eligible providers to be able to use telehealth, like speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, so that it really opened up the level of care and type of care that patients were able to receive at home. And while all of these things were great, we still don't know where we're going to land at the end of the day, um, because um, these changes really are, are while initially slated to last as long as the public health emergency does, there is work um, ongoing to be able to extend many of these things and how we integrate that into our cancer care delivery still remains a big question. Next slide. Um, and so um, to give you an example at my own institution of what happened, uh, this graph shows all of our telehealth visits within our cancer centers um, from January to August of 2020. Um, and we peaked in April in New York City. Um, and you know, the fascinating thing about this graph, green depicts video visits and orange are telephone or non-face-to-face, -face, so audio only visits um, by month. Um, and we really had, um, although it looks like it's on the zero line, it was like one video visit in January or February. And we quickly ramped that up to where you see we were over 3000 visits um, video or telehealth visits in April um, stayed there in May. And as the pandemic has improved in New York City, um, or the case rates have gone down, uh, so has our use of video visits. Um, but you see not to zero and so still has a really important role. And I think we're all figuring out what that role is. Um, next slide. I think it is important, though, to mention that one of the things that often happens as we roll out new novel um, uh, digital and, and technology, technologic uh, interventions, that there are often some unintended consequences. And in this case, particularly around disparities, you know, there is this concept of a digital divide um, and that because of issues with digital literacy, access to smart enabled devices, um, issues with broadband um, or um, internet access, that not everyone has the same level of access to this. And one of the things we did um, is that we looked at our own patient population between March and June um, to get a sense of what the difference were, differences were in our patient population based off of race and ethnicity. Um, and so, you know, 70%, 76% of all of our telehealth visits were video visits. However, we did see a significantly less utilization by minority patients of telehealth in total and video visits. And so what this graph shows you are that white patients are in green, black and yellow, Hispanic or Latinx in gray, Asian in orange and other in purple. Um, and on the, on the left column, the column all the way to the left, it shows our total population um, and then the total telehealth population. And what this shows you is that although our total population of black patients are 23%, they made up um, only 17% of our total video visits. Um, and similarly with Hispanic or Latinx patients, although they make up 14% of our total population um, during this time, seen during this time, um, only 5% of those patients, uh, only 5% of all of our video visit patients were uh, Hispanic or Latinx, you know, definitely signifying that there are disparities there um, and things that we need to work, work towards improving. Next slide. Um, so, you know, the question really is telehealth our future or is it just having a moment? Um, I think um, we, there are some things that we can expect in the future and some things that are still unknown. Um, you know, reimbursement parity for telehealth and in-person interactions is going to be really essential if we want widespread acceptance and adoption of this. Um, and second, we can have downstream implications that could really be transformative and that telehealth can really become an essential component of basic engagement and retention of patients, particularly if we're thinking in lung cancer, we have many patients who are on 
oral agents who, you know, are doing relatively well on them and don't need to come in to see us every month. And perhaps that could be a video visit paired with an at-home lab draw to check blood work. Um, similarly, for those lung cancer patients who are in survivorship mode, this could also be a fairly good modality to use for them. So I think figuring out the best way to integrate this into our, not just our cancer care delivery, but lung cancer in general will be really important. Um, I think that there's also going to have to be work ongoing to revise our care standards and our pathways to figure out those patient populations in whom this makes the most sense. Um, and, um, and I think really ultimately it is expanding the reach and capability of patients to access really high quality care. Next slide. Um, so I think, oh, this is the same slide. Go to the next slide, sorry. So I think challenges for the future will really be around figuring out um, interstate licensure challenges. Um, you know, many of those initial uh, um, sort of relaxation of who needed to be licensed in the state are starting to go away. Um, and as many of those, those physicians may know, it's hard to be licensed in certain states. And so that is certainly a barrier. Um, and then, my, you know, I think um, we need to really learn about how do you use this modality and talk about sensitive topics, um, such as progression or concern for progression, um, which may feel a little bit different when you're distant, not that we can't do it, but there's some additional training that needs to be involved with that. Um, next slide. So we're going to shift gears now and talk about symptom management of patients with lung cancer. Um, next slide. We know that there are multiple domains of symptoms that exist in lung cancer. There are certainly those physical symptoms, which are here in red. There are emotional symptoms, which can contribute to physical pain. Um, there are social concerns that exist, spiritual concerns, and then there's the informational domains. Next slide. And when we think about supportive care, um, you know, we can use the word palliative care, supportive care, depending on what you feel most comfortable with, which really is the bigger umbrella of care that we provide to patients regardless of their stage or their illness trajectory and whether they're receiving treatment with curative intent or treatment to prolong life and to improve quality of care with hospice really being a service that's provided when someone is at the end of life um, in whom there are no more disease cancer directed treatments that are being offered or would be helpful. Um, next slide. Um, and so there's this difference between primary and specialty palliative care. You know, primary palliative care is that care in which um, all oncology clinicians really should be able to do. Um, you know, this is basic management of pain, um, really being able to manage chemo induced nausea and vomiting. Um, being able to provide psychological support and having discussions about prognosis and, and goals. Specialty palliative care are really for those patients who have more complex refractory symptoms, maybe some persistent distress um, and concerns and, and challenges with coping and where there are complex um, you know, family interplay and concerns that exist that need more expert communication skills. Um, really focusing on legacy planning um, and then providing that family and caregiving support. Um, you know, I think the best way to think about this is making an analogy to like a cardiology consultant. So, you know, you don't refer every patient with a heart to cardiology, right? Nor, um, or every patient with an infection to an infectious disease specialist. It's just the really tough ones, the challenging ones where you need a little bit of extra help and especially palliative care is like that in a lot of ways. Next slide. Um, and so I'm gonna focus here on um, some, I think of what some of the most common symptoms are that we tend to see in lung cancer. First being the cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome, which really ends up being a diagnosis of exclusion. And there are multiple mechanisms that contribute to this. And often in patients, we see that it's multifactorial. Um, you know, when this happens and occurs um, when someone is closer to the end of life, it often signals that prognosis is limited um, and that time is short. 
Um, however, it could be related to a myriad of medical conditions um, that need to be evaluated and treated first. Um, next slide. And so here you can see several um, agents that have been used to treat um, can, the uh, cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome um, with very different levels of efficacy. So magesterol um, can improve appetite and is associated with a slight weight gain. It does have some side effects noted there, um, particularly thromboembolic events. Um, but in order for it to be considered effective, you have to get it up to a dose of 800 milligrams per day, which I think um, not everybody often tries to do. And it can be prohibiting because there is some nausea that may exist with that. Um, Google corticoids can work really well to improve the appetite. It doesn't really cause weight gain, but it helps people eat. Um, of course, you have to be concerned about hyperglycemia. And really we reserve the use of glucocorticoids to those patients who are more at nearing the end of life with a limited prognosis um, because of the long-term sequelae that occurs with glucocorticoids. Mirtazapine is actually a medication that was initially created for depression. And one of the um, side effects that they found was that there was significant weight gain um, in addition to um, helping with sleep at night. And so for my patients in whom they're having some difficulties with sleeping or insomnia, maybe they have some depression, um, but certainly um, issues around appetite um, exist. This is an, an agent that I will try. Um, and you can start at seven and a half milligrams or 15 milligrams. And I have found that it is actually pretty helpful. For any of these agents, I start it, I start it for two weeks. If we see benefit, great, we continue. If we don't see benefit, then I stop so that we don't add to the pill burden. Next slide. Um, so pain could be an entire hour and 20 minute lecture in and of itself. I will just briefly say here that there are um, different types of cancer pain, both acute and chronic, nociceptive and neuropathic. And depending on the type of pain really dictates the, our agents and how we choose to treat that pain. Next slide. There's the WHO ladder, which is used at World Health Organization step ladder that describes the medical approach to cancer pain. Um, there are strengths to this approach. I think most of us in, the, in this world think of this more as an elevator, that sometimes you have to get off on one floor to go up to the next or get off of one floor to step down. Um, but I think the point here is that you wanna start off with sort of the lowest um, agent in terms of potency and then move up depending on how someone responds to that. Next slide. Um, I think really important things to think about is what is the etiology of that pain um, because that can help um, uh, uh, steer the way in which you treat that pain. And so here just noting that, you know, bone pain could often be treated with local treatments um, and neuropathic pain can be treated with antidepressants, anticonvulsant agents, um, and analgesics. Next slide. Um, and I think it's important to think about opioid side effects, most commonly being constipation and ensuring that we're treating for that concomitantly with starting the opioid. Next slide. Um, Finally, the last symptom we'll talk about is dyspnea, which is seen pretty frequently in our patient population. And there are non-pharmacologic techniques to treat this and pharmacologic techniques. Non-pharmacologic techniques that have been helpful are relaxation techniques or providing psychosocial support, like through acupuncture or meditation. Um, honestly, having a fan blowing cool air into someone's face has been shown to be pretty helpful. If someone's hypoxemic, oxygen has been shown to be helpful and really just avoiding strong odors. In terms of pharmacologic appropriate uh, agents, opioids really are one of the mainstay agents to treat um, dyspnea. It decreases that sensation or that feeling of shortness of breath. Anxiolytics or like benzodiazepines if there is an anxiety component associated with the dyspnea. And then of course, COPD management if it's applicable and appropriate. And so next slide, in summary, um, oh, I had one more slide. Um, yes, I said this one, we can go to the next one. 
Um, in summary, telehealth um, is really a novel model of cancer care delivery and the exact role for telehealth in cancer care is still unknown. Um, and primary palliative care can be effectively provided by oncology clinicians um, and really ensuring that we are providing expert symptom management for our patients with lung cancer is critical to ensuring that they get the most, the best high quality cancer care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Absolutely a phenomenal presentation. We all learned a lot now from your presentation, Dr. Rodriguez's presentation, the interaction of the panel as well. I wanted to go around with the panel to say how they think about telehealth as well as symptom management. And I think there's a large room for telehealth with symptom management as well for us, for our patients. So that's phenomenal. Dr. Rodriguez, your thoughts? Um, so I, telehealth has really, you know, basically changed my clinic. I never used telehealth prior to COVID. And now I would think about 30% of patients I'm still seeing in telehealth, but we're all learning how to do it better. Um, we're learning that we are missing some information, like we're missing vitals, like the weight, the blood pressure monitoring. So we're kind of teaching ourselves and teaching the patients to collect some of that information to make the visits more meaningful. There's a lot of glitches in the technology. So we have patients that despite our best efforts, it's very hard to connect with them. They don't either have a phone with a camera or they don't have a device at home. So this is not gonna be the mode or they don't feel comfortable. But surprisingly, we, there's a very fast learning curve with the technology and we have been able to provide care during COVID and it has really allowed us to continue to connect with patients. And um, I think he's here to stay, but it's a complementary role. I still feel that patients need to come in for emergencies. They need to come in for, for things that need a longer discussion. And some patients really don't feel comfortable discussing some things online. So we have to be open to both. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Jill, your thoughts? Yes, I agree with what you both said and Dr. Smith said. I think, I hope it is here to stay. It would be wonderful for clinical trials, for follow-ups, for people who otherwise wouldn't have access. Uh, I do think though, the majority of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer are those that are from rural or underserved communities. And there's already this major disparity with their care. So I, looking at it big picture, I don't wanna ever forget you know, about that population. And the only other thing, I think it's really hard. I think, I think the approach should always be shared decision-making. So the goals of care, no matter where somebody is in their experience. And the conversation with the physician is absolutely necessary to see what the patient is comfortable with as well, not just what the physician thinks the patient needs. And I wanna give one word of caution to physicians that patients don't always report side effects. And whether it's fear of being taken off a clinical trial, whether it's fear of having a dose reduction, whether it's stubbornness or just someone who's determined. And I am like that sometimes. And I know I'm like that sometimes. So I think, you know, you have to be very careful in really paying attention to those patients because I've known a woman who put quarters in her shoes to weigh more when going to the oncologist. I mean, that you just, I think that that has to be something thought about as well before making those decisions. Thank you, Jill, very nicely said as well. And we have to be always be patient-centric and they're healthcare providers too, and not only that, but also their caregivers. That's so important to include everyone in their equation. Absolutely. So, uh, I'd love the uh, final thoughts from the whole panel so we can uh, really try to summarize in how we think about the future. Dr. Rodriguez, I'd like to start with you. Um, so, I, I mean, this year has been very somber in many ways, but I think the future and the approvals of new drugs and how I guess not fast enough, as you mentioned, but still, you know, faster than we ever seen before drugs being approved 
for specific populations and how important it is for patients to do their, you know, do their homework, like, you know, get, try to, you know, there's a lot of information now in the web. Um, you can demand things, you'll be, I have, you'll have access to your medical chart. So use all those tools to uh, be an advocate for yourself and have a true discussion and a shared decision going forward uh, with your oncologist. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Dr. Smith, your thoughts? Yes. Um, well, I am definitely looking forward to the future because like most of you, 2020 needs to be done already um, and look forward to many more great things to come. Um, I think the, mm, when I think the, to the future of lung cancer care, I really think focusing on how we better integrate personalized medicine into the way in which we, we make decisions about treatments for patients really is going to be a big focus. Um, I think there are, you know, as, 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 as Jill mentioned, our technology is far outpacing our ability to catch up with it. Um, and we have this ability to do these great tests without much knowledge, scientific knowledge about exactly what that impact is on the patient level. I think my last thought would be that what um, this whole pandemic has taught me is that as we think about how we change cancer care delivery, partnering with our, uh, our patients, um, their advocates, and those stakeholders are really going to be critically important as we reshape the way in which we provide care in a way that's really patient-centered, um, and to Jill's point, really gets that shared decision-making. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Jill, your thoughts? Yes, I, considering my history with the disease, this is fabulous. I think the advancements in lung cancer research and treatments have truly benefited so many people. They've benefited me. I'm not sure where I would be. I was diagnosed in 2009 and I have benefited from targeted new targeted therapies. I have benefited from SBRT. I have benefited from a lot of it. So I love that patients are living longer and better lives and we are able to advocate and we are here to partner with physicians in any way that we can because we have something that they most likely don't which is the lived experience and so understanding what's important and meaningful to the population is important overall survival is not the only important endpoint, right? We also want to live well. And that, what does that look like? Well, we don't know because targeted therapies haven't been around long enough to understand the long term effects. So I also would like to make sure that when we're talking about targeted therapies, especially as adjuvant therapy, that we're really talking about the big picture and we're talking about benefits versus risks. And there's so much that physicians don't know when you're talking to a patient about any kind of therapy. Sometimes you don't have complete information and patients are trying to make this decision based on complex information that they have at a time when it's really emotional and there's a lot of anxiety. So it's hard to think clearly. And so I just wanna emphasize again that personalized medicine requires getting personal with the patient and talking about goals of care what is important to them besides living longer? What are they willing to give up? What trade-offs are they willing to make? And, you know, I, I've said this a lot, so some may have heard me say it, but you may not save every patient's life, but if you help your patients find their hope, then you will make a difference in every patient's life, and that matters. Thank you, Jill. Uh, very well said. And I wanted to echo everyone. Uh, it's actually absolutely true. There are a few thoughts is that one of the things that has affected us uh, very heavily in the COVID-19 era is screening. 
we really have to do early screening. We have to identify our patients in an early stage if possible, because that will lead to a faster cure. Second thing, I can't emphasize that enough, and especially in my career, uh, funding the research. Uh, we couldn't have gotten here without the research. Um, you know, I used to do leukemia research in the past, and now uh, for a long time, I've done lung cancer and leukemia and breast cancer and colon cancer. The research is so well-funded as compared to lung cancer. We really have to uh, start those grassroots movements, which you all have done, and uh, also on, in the audience, we need to make, make more of an effort. And I wanted to thank, finally, this educational component with Total Health Conferencing. Without this education, the word won't get out. So thank you so much to the whole panel for attending. Thank you to Total Health Conferencing for sponsoring us. And have a great day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>